Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to the uh, this edition of the Tower Center monthly seminar. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, a new visitor to SMU. It's first time here at the Bell Top and this first time at the Tower Center. Uh, this is Professor Professor Josh Schifferson from Texas A&M and the Bush School of Public Policy. Uh, as you'll see, Professor Schifferson works on many interesting issues, grand strategy, strategy, American foreign policy. What's interesting, particularly about his work, is that he's a political scientist by training. He went to MIT, but he's deeply, deeply interested in historical research. And, and there's, a, there's a dirty little secret among political scientists that not all of them love spending time in the archives. Paper not all it's of paper them. That's paper mm -hmm. cuts. Yeah. Uh, not, not this political scientist. He spends a great deal of time in the archives. He, he doesn't use history to ornament his theories. He dives deeply into it. And I think that's really relevant for the Tower Center because the, the, the ethos of the Tower Center is connecting political theory with practical politics. Well, if you want to do practical politics, you have to know the stuff of politics. You, know how, you have to know how it actually uh, works. And he adopts the same approach in his research in understanding big ideas about grand strategy and international relations theory but with a very, very serious historical deep dive to, 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 to support his arguments. Uh, as I said, Professor Schifferson is at a and this year. Next year, he will be on a very prestigious fellowship at Dartmouth, which we just learned the good news. Congratulations thank to you, that. Thanks. And the topic of his talk today is Falling Giants. Sure. Uh, Josh, thanks for having me up, and you forgot the real reason I work in archives, uh, it makes me feel cool about myself, right? In relative terms, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the most interesting person there, so I'm actually, that's, that's the real reason I do this, it's entirely self-motivated. But at any rate, uh, this talk is entitled Falling Giants, Rising States, and the Fate of Declining Great Powers, uh, and it, it comes out of what I regard as one observation and then a couple of core puzzles from the modern history of national foreign relations. So the first one is this, right? We often think about the post-war era, the post-World -war, War II era, as one of stability in the overall distribution of power, right? The U.S. has always been dominant. But that's not entirely true, right? First of all, we had one transition in the immediate post-war era as pre-war and then World War II multipolarity gave way to a period of bipolar where Britain, one of the big three victors in World War II, fell from the ranks of the great powers. First change in the distribution of power. Then the second one occurred at the end of the Cold War, where when people, what people thought would be a period of enduring bipolarity as late as 1989, rapidly gave way to a period whereby early 1991, folks like Charles Krauthammer were discussing the unipolar moment. So there's fundamental change in the distribution of power that we often forget to recognize. And so the puzzle, the question is really this. Uh, what would we expect the United States to do or any state to do when faced with these fundamental changes in the distribution of power. And we can think about this most clearly at the end of the Cold War. I think we all know that the USSR declined in the late 1980s and early 1990s. I don't need to go into too much detail. But we can think about this in visual terms, right? This is Europe in 1988. And there are a couple of things that jump out of here. Uh, first of all, there's this big state called the Soviet Union on the side of the map, right? Uh, second, it has a bunch of allies with power its influence extends to the heart of Eastern Europe. And Germany itself is divided in two. And of course, the USSR is opposed by the NATO allies and the United States across the ocean. This is the situation just a few years later. A couple of things. The USSR is gone, right? There's no more USSR. Fundamental change in the distribution of power has occurred. The Soviet allies are gone. Germany has reunified. And NATO has begun marching east, including taking many of the Soviet Union's allies. So the question is this. What would we expect the United States to do when faced with such a change in the distribution of power? Right? Well, if you're Ken Waltz, this is a time to declare victory in the Cold War and go on home. Right? No more threat, you can wrap it up. If you're John Mearsheimer, this is an opportunity to keep stabbing the Soviet Union in the heart and just kill it all the harder. And if you're John, and if you're John Eikenberry, this is a time to bind the USSR into Western institutions and prop it up in some way. Well, in fact, the United States did none of these things. In fact, what we see is that American foreign policy, faced with the rapid decline of Soviet power, went through two sudden phases. In the first phase, there was an effort by the United States to, adopt, to see slow and steady change in the Eastern Bloc and, and uh, the collapse of Soviet power. 
only for it to suddenly turn on a dime at the start of 1990 as the United States pursued the rapid reunification of Germany, the rapid dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, and a period of American hegemony. So I want to explain this change, which brings me to a bigger political science theoretical question, right? Which is, when a great power declines, what strategies do other relatively rising states adopt? And in particular, why do some states pursue predatory strategies why, that try to slow or stop change in the distribution of power to buck up the declining state? Why do other states adopt predatory strategies that try to push the declining state down or further or from the great power ranks entirely? And above all, I want to explain why these strategies change, both in terms of type, the choice between predation and support, and in terms of degree. Why do we see differing degrees of predation or support across time and space? So that's going to give you, going to give you a flavor of today. And lest we think this is an entirely an academic issue, we also know that predation during decline is an ongoing policy concern. One could point to any number of worries about the rise of China and the fate of the United States when faced with the rise of China. Uh, or India, for that matter. I could point to any number of states that we worry about. I guess I should flag at the front end that by decline, I simply mean the sustained loss of one state's economic and military capabilities relative to another. Very simple kind of ecumenical definition of decline. And to give you a very simple preview of my answer, I'm going to argue that rising states ask themselves a very simple question. They ask themselves, can the declining state help maintain a stable distribution of power? And if the rising state thinks it can gain hegemony, become the only great power in the system, and do so cheaply, it's inclined to pursue predatory strategies. On the other hand, if the, de if the rising state thinks the declining state can be useful as a SOP or as a prop or as an aid against future great power threats, it's inclined to pursue supportive strategies. I'm going to talk about how these different uh, incentives wax and wane over time. So to give you a very quick preview, I'm now going to go through very briefly some existing arguments and cover my argument. I'll, cut, I'll then talk about in some detail two of the cases I study, that is American policy towards the decline of the Soviet Union, and then U.S. and Soviet strategy towards the decline of the British after World War II. And then I'll wrap it up by talking about some conclusions and implications. Hopefully I have time for all this. So what I'm talking about here are the strategies of relatively rising states. And by strategy, I simply mean a political military ends means chain designed to structure the rising state's relations with the declining great power. And we can think about this very along two different dimensions. Uh, first of all, the goals. Some states might want to eliminate the declining state as a great power. Others might want to preserve the declining state as a great power. Very basic ideas, right? Do I want to see the declining state gone, or do I want to see it kept around? So that's the goal. But I also want to know about the means employed. And here, I can think about it in terms of cautious means, where a state gradually escalates the, the uses of force, gradually escalates its tools of economic and military influence to pursue those goals, versus intense means, where a state will use any and all assets at its disposal, any and all tools at its disposal, to bring about this desired end state. And when you put this all together, we get the classic political science two-by-two two table, right? This, this certifies me as a, real, as a real researcher, where we can think about rising states adopting intensely predatory strategies where they use any and all means at their disposal to kill the declining state as a great power, perhaps like preying upon the declining state's allies or waging, permit, uh, waging a war against the declining state. We could think about uh, things like moderate predatory strategies where states want to want to eliminate the declining state but don't want to necessarily go use force. They're hesitant to isolate the declining state. They may refuse to negotiate with it, maybe get engaged in arms races to exhaust it over time but don't go for the jugular in a meaningful sense. On the other hand, we can imagine moderately supportive strategies where a state is willing to give some economic and military assistance to a declining state, offer it some political protections, but isn't necessarily willing to go to war for it or transfer large-scale amounts of resources. And then finally, we can think about intensive supportive strategies, right? things like the Marshall Plan, where a state is willing to go to almost any means at its disposal to keep the declining state around. Right? So a classic political science two part. So I'm, with all, I'm not the first person to get interested in this question, right? Other folks, like John Mearsheimer, say that states generally pursue power maximization strategies. On the other hand, you have folks like John Eikenberry and folks in the democratic peace theory who suggest that the more economically integrated, the more internationally institutionally embedded, the more similar the regime types of these different states, the more supportive these strategies are, the more su supportive we expect rising states to be. 
But the problem is, these different theories miss important variation in rising state strategy, right? They have difficulty explaining why some strategy become more or less intensive or supportive over time. And above all, they miss what I regard as the fundamental security logic driving rising state behavior that I'm going to talk about in just a second. So to give you a very brief flavor of my argument, I'd be happy to talk more about this in Q&A, but I want to give plenty of time for the empirics. I'm going to argue that rising states often do seek power. John Mearsheimer is right on this one. But that the opportunities to seek power are really, really quite limited. Because states, first and foremost, want to hold on to what they have. And in particular, even though a rising state might benefit from growing relatively stronger at a declining state's expense, you have to worry about paying three possible security costs against the declining state. Uh, first, as we know from going as far back as Thucydides, a rising state that punches the declining state too hard might get punched right back. It might wind up in a preventive war, might wind up in a crisis that can undermine the ability to continue rising. Second, if a rising state goes for the jugular of the declining state, might up, end up in generating a counterbalancing coalition. Folks talk about this with China and Japan today. And above all, if a rising state is truly sagacious and forward-thinking, it might realize that it's living in an uncertain world where today's friend might be tomorrow's enemy, and that killing a declining state, pushing a declining state from the great power ranks, might foreclose future alliance opportunities. People forget, for example, that the British were allied with the Japanese for a very long time before the nasty business of World War, I, World War II. That's to give you a flavor of the uncertainty of international politics. So putting this all together, I argue that predatory strategies are most likely to occur when there are big gains to be had and very low costs to be paid. And in particular, we should expect to see this in bipolar situations, situations with only two great powers, where the rising state thinks it can become a hegemon. That should just incentivize predation writ large. Bipolarity encourages predatory strategies. But in particular, we worry it would, even then, a rising state would have to worry about the declining state's ability to retaliate, its military posture, its ability to impose costs by threatening a crisis or a war. So we're most likely to see the most predatory strategies in bipolar situations where a declining state can no longer militarily retaliate. On the other side of the spectrum, we expect to see supportive strategies when the gains are unclear or even low, but in particular when the costs of predation are quite large. And in these situations, we would expect it to be most common when there are lots of other great power threats out there, when counterbalancing coalitions are possible, where preventive war is always a possibility, and in particular, where we worry about other states coming to the aid of a declining state or attacking me in the future. In particular, multipolar settings, situations with many great powers should be most inclined to these dynamics. Uh, now, counterintuitively, we would expect, or we would expect that supportive strategies, supportive behavior, <clears throat> be most intense when the declining state can only protect itself even in multipolar settings. Now, why is that? Well, because by going after a very weak declining state, very weak declining state in a multipolar setting, you're sending a strong signal to other states that you might be nasty in the future, right? Encouraging them to come intensely to the declining state's aid. And number two, that's the situation where if I push too hard, the declining state might fall entirely and there'll be losses in the future. So putting this all together, I predict that there are going to be four different rising state strategies depending upon a combination of the distribution of power, the polarity of the international system, and the declining state's own military choices, what I call its military posture. In situations where it's a bipolar situation and the declining state can't protect itself and has a weak posture, then the rising state can pursue polarity free of the possibility of preventive war. In situations where the declining state is in a bipolar setting but can't protect itself, predation's still there. You still want to bid for hegemony. But you're not going to go all out lest you end up in a preventive war that you see the world through sitting just describes. On the other hand, in a multipolar setting where the declining state is strong, you're probably going to see rising states slowly see if it's worthwhile aiming at the declining state that might still be able to protect itself. They can pay low costs and still get the benefits of multipolarity. And finally, if the declining state is weak in a multipolar setting, that's when I'm most likely to see the intensive support that I talked about a moment ago. So far, so good. Everyone's on board. So how am I going to talk about this? Let me offer some examples from what I regard as some modern cases of international politics. The case of U.S. policy and the decline of the USSR, and the case of U.S. and Soviet policy towards the decline of the United Kingdom. So I'll just briefly talk about this. I think what's nice about these cases are they let me leverage detailed processes from American history. 
who this Jeff Engel and I were discussing before. Uh, I've done a fair bit of archival research, gone to such places as the Truman Library, the Reagan Library, the National Archives. I've used the Q electronic resources online. And for the U.S. case uh, with the decline of the USSR, I also interviewed almost 60 former members of the Reagan and Bush administrations to get some pretty fine uh, grain detail on American policy during this period. So let me talk about that in some way. I'll start with the Soviets. Uh, I think we, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm trying to explain how we go from a world where it's a bipolar standoff with this big clunky thing called the USSR to a world where the U.S. is reigning supreme. And I'm going to try to show you, in, in, unless we want to see this in economic terms, this is just a rough sense of how Soviet decline manifested, right? We see the Soviet Union more or less holding steady vis-a-vis -vis the United States until the mid-1970s, gradually encountering some problems in the late 70s and early 80s, and then really hitting a period of problems at the tail end of the 1980s, right? That's when stuff really begins to manifest. And as we watch that manifest, I'm going to show you that the degree of predation escalates, in particular as Soviet military posture shifts. And what's interesting about this is that this is a very short period, but the world turns. American strategy does a 180 in the world. Changes profoundly. I'm not going to say it does a 180. It changes profoundly. Second, the nuances in Soviet military policy and the American assessment of Soviet military policy are absolutely key. And above all, that policymakers, members of the Bush administration, expressly spoke in these terms in a way that other scholars haven't picked up upon. So let me talk about this. Uh, again, I'm going to see, just to give you a preview of it, I'm going to see a period of moderate predation from the late 1980s into the tail end of 1989 giving away very quickly to a period of intense predation over the course of 1990 into 1991. So what do we have here? Well, for the first phase of American policy, we actually see the U.S. adopting a moderate predatory strategy, what I would call a moderate predatory strategy. Members of the Reagan administration engaged in progressive arms control, aiming to gradually incorporate American strategic advantages over the USSR through a series of build downs. Not, not overly intensively, right? The U.S. thought it could gain advantages, but it's unclear what it could gain. But it's very clear from George Shultz's memoirs and folks like Colin Powell that there's a real desire to make gradual gains at the USSR expense by building down simultaneously. But more importantly, once the Bush administration comes into office in 1989, the U.S. pursued what I would call gradualism in Eastern Europe, particularly as change began to occur in, in Poland and Hungary as communist regimes began to teeter and fall. Uh, in fact, this goes so far that when the Polish Solidarity government comes to power in June 1989, the U.S. actually sends a cable, or this embassy <laughs> sends a cable, describing how to elect communist leader Jaruzelski, Wojtek Jaruzelski, president of Poland, and get Solidarity to buy into that. Now, if we know anything about American foreign policy during the 1980s, the U.S. was funding solidarity in opposition to the Polish communist government. This is a pretty strong signal that the U.S. wasn't inclined to see rapid change too quickly. More importantly, as the U.S. begins to gradually get involved in Eastern Europe, the U.S. always sends emissaries over to coordinate policies with the USSR. And in fact, this becomes really pronounced as German reunification began to kick in towards in the fall and then winter of 1989. In fact, the U.S. doesn't even endorse uh, F, uh, West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl's plan to gradually reunify Germany until clearing the policies with the Soviet Union itself. So the U.S. is moving very cautiously, very hesitantly, and indeed trying to slow change in the region in some cases as Soviet power begins to teeter and fall. It's really kind of weird if we think about the overall narrative of American foreign policy in the late 1980s. So why is this? Well, what we find is that the Soviets had an incredibly strong military posture. And American policymakers, as Brent Scowcroft told me, could have, were worried that the Soviets could always slow or stop changes in the region. There are almost 400,000 Soviet troops in East Germany alone that could be used to repress, it, to repress East, East German change, to, to stop change in Poland or Hungary, and if things got out of hand, could end up in a war with the United States itself. In fact, I don't need to just describe this to you. Uh, this is a memo on GDR crisis contingencies completed three days before the Berlin Wall fell in November of 1989, written by Bob Blackwell, uh, who's been a senior national security council member. And it's an interesting what this memo says, because it's explicit in what American priorities are. He says, in the event of severe internal unrest in East Germany, our overriding objective should be to prevent a Soviet military intervention, which could and probably would reverse the positive course of East-West East -West relations for many years to come. More than that, 
who would raise the risk of direct U.S.-Soviet military confrontation. This is a pretty gutsy statement of we're worried about a crisis with the USSR and want a slow change if a problem occurs. And this isn't just an interagency issue. In fact, be shortly before... I got it? Okay. In fact, shortly before the Malta summit of 1989, Brent Skolkov wrote a memo to President Bush where he explained in even more detail that, unlike the Ottoman Empire, Moscow's military capabilities have not declined commensurate with the Soviet Union's political and economic changes. I should just add here, there are always comparisons to the Ottoman Empire in these documents. It's just an interesting side note. Uh, that the instrument of last resort is still available to the Soviet Union, and there are no guarantees that the Soviet Empire will go quietly into the night. So Skullcroft and Bush are intensely worried that pushing too fast on Germany and on Eastern Europe could trigger a crisis of unknown potential for U.S.-Soviet relations. The U.S. policy, the U.S. desire to prey upon the USSR is kept in check accordingly. Now what's interesting is that suddenly, beginning in January 1990, this policy changes. And as people like Mary Cerati and Jeff here know well, beginning in January of 1990, the U.S. begins to pursue the rapid reunification of Germany within NATO in almost no regard for Soviet interests. In fact, within a few months, what the State Department called the crown jewel of the Soviet Empire was yanked out of the Warsaw Pact. No end, the policymakers recognized that in doing so, it was destroying the, they were destroying the Warsaw Pact, reunified with West Germany, and the entire state shoved into the NATO, NATO alliance. In the process, things like the two plus four negotiations on German reunification were structured expressly to deny the Soviet Union a vote in the outcome. And of course, when the Soviets come around asking for economic assistance, economic aid, to kind of compensate them for this, the U.S. refuses to pay for it. In fact, Bush famously tells German, West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl that Kohl has deep pockets to pay the Soviets for this, but the U.S. wasn't going to pay. And if we think about this in terms of possible outcomes, this is a memo that was authored by Bob Hutchings, uh, currently at the LBJ School, and then signed off by Robert Blackwell, uh, that when describing the possible range of outcomes for German reunification, lists Germany and NATO, with NATO forward defenses extending to the oder Nisa, that is the Poland-German border line, and U.S. and allied other forces remain, U.S. nuclear weapons remain as well. Now, when this memo was written in February 1990, no one thought they were going to be able to get this outcome. But by September of 1990, when the Treaty on German Reunification is signed, this is exactly the outcome they had. So in comparison to the prior period, <laughs> this is a period of rapid escalation, of rapid predation, and intense predation upon the USSR. So the question is why? Well, I argue that Soviet military posture transformed in the winter of 1990. In fact, we see East Germans demanding that Soviet troops go home beginning in the winter of 1990. And where before Soviet officials were not willing to negotiate on this issue, afterwards, after the winter of 1990, the Soviets sign off on this. The Warsaw Pact began to fragment. And with the changes in Poland and Hungary throughout the winter and, sp winter and spring of 1989, the Soviet ability to maintain a presence in Syria was rapidly waning. Condoleezza Rice, when she was a National Security Council staff member, was expressly asked, and this is in the Philip, Philip Zelico and Condi Rice book on German reunification, whether the U.S. Should, can, should side with the Soviets and continue slowing change in the region or escalate and support the West Germans in overcoming uh, Soviet opposition. Her response is instructive. She wrote in tw on 23 January 1990 that she believed that the Soviets would not even threaten the Germans if the U.S. escalated. Within six months, if events continue as they're going, no one would believe the Soviet threat to use force anyway. Condi Rice is explicit on this issue. And lest we think this is just retrospective, this is a memo written uh, roughly concurrent with Condi Rice in which Bob Hutchings and Bob Blackwell wrote to Brent Skogroff that if the Soviets oppose American plans, we could remind Gorbachev that his troops are fast being pushed out of the region anyway and offered to work with them. In so many terms, with the Soviets unable to threaten force, the only deal the Soviets were going to make, were going to be able to get, was the deal the U.S. is going to offer. So to summarize all this, right, U.S. strategy varied in a very short period of time, and that archival research showed that predation expanded, increased, intensified as Soviet military power waned, and that U.S. leaders argued about U.S. security and U.S. policy in line with what I predicted in this theory. Let me just turn this around and briefly go through the second case, which is Britain's decline in the early Cold War. Uh, I'm doing okay on time? Okay. So 
We often think about Britain as a very weak state at the tail end of World War II, but as Paul Avey actually shows in some of his own work, Britain was more or less in the game as a great power for a very for a surprisingly long period of time. Uh, this is the distribution of power at the tail end of World War II. We can see that the UK and the USSR are actually not that far apart until about 1947, when the Brits began a rapid nosedive. And few people like William Fox, Bill Fox at Columbia University, in his first book called The Superpowers, where the term is coined, includes Great Britain as one of the three superpowers. People forget this. So this is kind of a... Oh, that, that's, just the di that's just the distribution of European military capabilities. I took this from a various sundry assortment of, of correlates of war indicators, GDP indicators. It, it was coded in a couple of different ways. So let me emphasize what I regard as the two phases, and, I'll, and I flag that because you'll see that it's in fact three phases of the USSR uh, of strategy for the United States and the Soviet Union. Again, I'm going to argue that there's going to be a shift from multipolarity, from multipolarity to bipolarity at the end of this period. But that so long as it's multipolar, it's as shifts in British military posture occur, particularly the British retrenchment from Europe beginning in early 1947, that causes a zeitgeist shift in American strategy. So let me talk about this very briefly. The first period we see is one of moderate support by the United States and the USSR. In fact, we see folks like Secretary of State Jim, Jimmy Burns writing that Britain must continue as the principal power in Western Europe. The United States, as I'm sure many of you know, planned to retrench from Europe at the end of World War II, not get involved anymore. In that regard, it was very important to buck past to, to the British, to rely upon the British to maintain Western Europe's economic and military solidarity in the face of a, of a potential Soviet threat. With the British Empire still stretching across most of the globe, it wasn't intuitively crazy that this was a possibility. And accompanying this desire to buck past while America got out and relied upon the British to maintain the, si the situation in Western Europe, there's a recognition by the United States that each country would have a free hand in their respective spheres of influence. The United States built and banked upon the possibility that the British would dominate in Western Europe, that the Soviets would dominate in Eastern Europe, and the United States would stand between the two as a sort of a neutral arbiter. And this was going to be the key to post-World post War II international security. Now, rely, to make that policy a reality, the U.S. needed to be fairly ambivalent about the British, to not pay too much attention to the British as British power would. Now, what's interesting is that accompanying this was almost exactly the same Soviet strategy. And this is built upon translated Soviet documents recently released from Soviet archives and worked by other historians in this world. Uh, as the war winds down, former Soviet foreign minister Maxim Litvinov is asked to is tasked to recapitulate what he expects to be the post-World War, uh, post War II world. And in his report, he expressly says that it will be in the USSR's interest to keep Britain as a strong power. And in particular, the states of Western Europe were assigned to the British sphere of influence. To make that situation a reality, the Soviets instructed various communist groups in Western Europe to cooperate in the reconstruction effort in France, in Italy, and Greece. Yes, there were efforts to upset the British there, to upset the British there, but they were done by local actors that the Soviets were viscerally opposed to. Uh, and perhaps above all, contrary to the notion of an antagonistic and nasty USSR at this point in time, the Soviets are the biggest proponents of what we, what we forget, but what was a real international institution at the time, called the Council on Foreign Ministers. This was an effort by the foreign ministers of Britain and the United States and the USSR to manage affairs in Western Europe. The Soviets are the biggest proponents of this. So the question is, why is it the Soviets and the Americans pursued somewhat of an ambivalent but broadly supportive strategy towards the British after World War II? Well, a lot of it is that the British were the biggest force, second biggest force in Europe by this point in time. If you just go through and count the troops in Europe at this point in time, uh, by well, shortly after World War II ends, uh, you actually find the British are the second biggest military in Europe. And in fact, they're pumping almost all their forces, all their remaining military forces, into maintaining a very strong position on the continent. The Royal Air Force, the British military, yeah, Jeff. Is that just Britain? Just, just British forces on the continent? Yes, that's just British so forces. Not, talking about British forces in Britain. I'm not talking about British forces in Britain. And you're classifying the Soviets as European? I am classifying the Soviets as European. Yes. 
The British are pulling forces, in fact, out of colonial holdings to keep the presence in Europe alive. And in fact, Clement Attlee, who was the British Prime Minister at this point in time, has to slap his uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff around to get them to sign up for this. The British Chiefs of Staff want to maintain an imperial presence, but he forces them to pull remaining forces out of the colonial holdings and put them into Europe. And as we see this, we actually see American and Soviet policymakers worried about the results of this dynamic. American policymakers worry, on the one hand, that yes, defeat or disintegration of the British Empire would eliminate from Eurasia the last bulwark of resistance to the USSR. But at the same time, there's a real worry that the British are building up in a way that could antagonize the USSR and undermine American plans to get out of Europe. We actually see policymakers writing that the UK sought to mobilize, quote, American manpower and resources to, to sustain Britain's lead in Europe. And more importantly, as William Leahy, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, writes at the time, he says that the greatest likelihood of eventual conflict between Britain and Russia would seem to grow out of either nation initiating attempts to build up its strength. Well, the only way this was going to cause a conflict is if the British could actually make a game of it, make a go of it. And so counterintuitively, this strong British effort to maintain the lead in Western Europe, though it met one American imperative, it undermined the desire to stay neutral and, arm and stay between the Soviets and the Americans. Oh, excuse me, the Soviets and the British. Excuse me. So that's the, that's the American side. What about the Soviets? Well, we actually find the Lit Litvinov report arguing that the British want that the Soviets wanted to keep the British strong, particularly because everyone expected the U.S. to engage in imperialistic in expansion. The Soviets believed that the Americans were going after the British after the war, and that the Soviets were going to be after the British. So therefore, the Soviets wanted to keep the British alive as a way of balancing the Americans. So, support the British. Okay, that makes sense. But at the same time, there's real worry that Anglo-Soviet cooperation was, was only going to be possible if the UK stopped threatening the Soviet holdings in Europe, stopped supporting uh, communist forces in Eastern Europe, stopped threatening a war that might challenge the Soviets in Eastern Europe, stopped being the lead, biggest cheerleader in opposing Soviet influence in Europe. So the real, there's a real Soviet worry that the British are trying to ensnare the United States and make a game effort in fostering a counterbalancing coalition. So there's a real concern that at a time when the British are strong, the Soviets might pay some costs. So, all this changes in the winter of 1947, in the winter of 1946-47. In fact, we see American support suddenly escalate. And we see this most clearly when we have things like the Truman Doctrine, which as probably many of you know is a statement by Truman that, we, that the U.S. would back any free group resisting the Soviets. It begins over the issues of Greece and Turkey. Now, who are Greece and Turkey important to? It's the British. And in fact, it's when the British pullout kicks in and the British begin pulling back their forces from Europe that we see things like the Truman Doctrine kick in, things like the Marshall Plan kick in. And in fact, in writing the Marshall Plan, folks like George Kennan and George C. Marshall say that it is the, in the interest of, world, of overall recovery, we are and will continue to do our utmost to keep Britain afloat. Britain is singularly important to the success of the Marshall Plan because, again, the American buck passing effort was never going to go away. I'm about, I'm about to show, show you. It's even more than that. It's even more than that. When yeah. did that happen? The, the pull-up from Greece and Turkey, the notes arrive in February of 47. And what's even more important, after the Marshall Plan's announced, after the Truman Doctrine kicks in, we actually see the U.S. begin to negotiate an alliance in a way that the British had always wanted, but the Americans had previously rejected. In fact, the American policymakers at the time say that so long as the U.S. elects to take these steps, meaning an alliance negotiation, Britain will be reassured to remain joint with the United States in a firm policy counter to that of the Soviets. Alternatively, if the U.S. was not going to back the British, there was a real worry the British were going to ally with the Soviets and ban back with the Soviet Union. Now, on the Soviet side, that's where things get interesting, and I flagged the three, you know, the shift in Soviet strategy. Now, what's interesting is that after the winter of 1947, we get things like the resurrection of communist opposition, <coughs> communist subversion throughout Western Europe. Entirely true. And things like the coup in Czechoslovakia, the creation of East Germany, things that antagonize the Americans and the British. Entirely true. Here's, here's what people forget, and what historians haven't recognized. In, in the very tail end of 1946, December of 1946 and January of 1947, the Soviets offer an alliance to the British, beating the Americans to the punch. And, in fact, the British are interested in the deal. Ernest Bevin, uh, after cabinet discussion, is authorized, and this is from a cabinet document found in February of 47, to negotiate a treaty with the Soviets 
going as far as the Anglo-French Treaty. Now, that's really kind of interesting, right? Because the thing about Britain, uh, Franco-British relations, we don't think of Britain and France as adversaries. In fact, they're bosom buddies in a lot of different ways. They fight side by side in 1940. In the post-war period, there's discussions of getting France involved in an anti-German alliance. So here, the British foreign secretary, who is a visceral anti-communist, is being told to negotiate an alliance with the Soviets. So the British are actually interested in the Soviet deal. It's actually a very strong signal of Soviet interest in keeping Britain, protecting Britain at this point in time. Well, a, a, as a side note, Churchill, in fact, had, had planned in 1945 and told the British military to plan for a preventive war against the Soviets. But the British military said, we don't want to play this game. So here's, an interest, here's what's interesting about this phase of, of the shift in American strategy. These shifts in Soviet and American strategy coincide with a massive British retrenchment. Now, it was mentioned the pull-up from Greece and Turkey. That doesn't quite do it justice. Beginning in November and December of 46, the British military announces that because of its worsening economic conditions, it's going to be pulling all, it's going to be cutting its military budget. It's almost a bare bone state. And whereas before, in that, throughout 1946, the British were going to be devoting their marginal resources to the continent, keeping more than four divisions in Germany alone, seven extra divisions in southeastern Europe, and maintain the Royal Air Force as best it can. After 47, it's a pullout of the purest form. There are going to be no British forces to speak of in Germany. There are going to be no British forces to speak of in Southeastern Europe and Central Europe. There's going to be a power vacuum of the purest kind. They're getting rid of guns and going for all the better. Well, that's the, the, this is the, this, there's an interesting ban entrapment issue because what the British are constructing the socialist state at this point in time. So it's an interesting question of how much of this was a game of chicken. Nevertheless, when the news of the British pullout arrives, we see American and Soviet strategies change. In fact, when the British notes the pullout arrived from Greece and Turkey, uh, American policymakers describe themselves as <coughs> met at Armageddon's door. In fact, there's a worry that if the U.S. doesn't come in too intensely, too soon, that the British government might decide that they must come to an arrangement with the Soviet Union, being British with, the British with bandwagon, and they would be lost as an American ally. And it was vital in the American assessment not to let this happen. Because it was important to keep Britain in a state of independence, friendly to the United States, with an economy able to support the armed forces. That's the inspiration for the Truman Doctrine. That's the inspiration for the Marshall Plan and inspiration for the, for the Anglo-American alliance negotiations that culminated in NATO. Now, what's interesting is that the Soviets actually seem to undertake a similar analysis. We don't have good data on this, but anecdotally or circumstantially, we have some data for this. Uh, after the Americans come in with the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan, we see the Soviets accusing the Americans of collaboration against the USSR and fostering the anti-Soviet alliance. So in that regard, that's a problem for my theory. That's totally accurate. But prior to this point, Soviet policymakers present the alliance offer as a way of hedging against Germany, as a way of keeping the peace in Europe if the US pulled out of Europe, and then a recognition, too, that the U.S. was going, was looking predatory. It was actually looking like it might be nasty in the world, and therefore the British should work with the Soviet Union. Stalin actually wrote that the small European countries follow America out of necessity and yield to her through fear and attempting to entice the British into outline with the Soviets. So, I, I'm forgetting about the French, but that's okay. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the, what's the takeaway here? Well, as I predicted, right, we actually see the U.S. and the USSR pursuing varied strategies that seem to shift, that do shift in response to the British ability to threaten or ensnare or pose strategic problems to the two sides. We actually saw in both cases that support for the British grew as the military position of Britain waned, and that U.S. and Soviet decision makers again spoke and made arguments in line with what my theory predicts. So, let me just pull back for a second. Now, let me just so overall. We find that, contrary to a lot of popular arguments, rising states often run scared. They're neither natural-born killers, as John Mearsheimer would have it, nor are they fellow travelers who just care about regimes and institutions, as John Eikenberg in Democratic Peace Theory said so that. That, in fact, states act and leaders speak in line with the argument that hinges on security costs or benefits of aiding or preying upon declining states. And that this theory that I've offered, this notion of, of opportunities for hegemony or hedges against threats, Wax and wane on the nature of rising can largely explain the nature of rising state. So that's the theoretical summary. But let me talk very briefly about implications for American foreign policy. And I'll just say a few words about this. Now, circling back to the concerns that I raised before about a rising China, 
this overall takeaway is that China should in fact be a cautious riser. Uh, we don't know how China sees the world. Right? A lot of this hinges on what the distribution of power looks like and how states assess. We don't know how China sees the world. But let's just think about this for a second. A multipolar world would give China real incentive to keep the U.S. involved. It probably, the Chinese probably would not welcome the United States that was too weak to help constrain Japan or Russia or India. The U.S. has value to the Chinese in a multipolar world. But what about a, what about a bipolar world? Well, this is the situation where the U.S. actually has a lot of carbs to play. The U.S. military is the world leader in air and sea assets that are relevant to deterring and controlling China. And so in that regard, even if China thinks it might one day be in a position to bid for hegemony, as long as the U.S. maintains some kind of plausible lead and can impose some cost upon the Chinese, China should still be a fairly cautious uh, predator. And ultimately in this situation, the U.S. is playing a really strong hand in the way that I think a careful look at history and a careful theorizing about history can give us a flavor of. And so with that, uh, let me step back and just take some questions. Well, I will be keeping the cue, so please raise your hand. Roki. Okay. Um, so my question is that, um, about China. So uh, going, back to this, uh, going to the last part of your discussion. So your example of the US, U.S. versus USSR yeah. and the U.S. versus U.K., when the powerful state starts declining uh, in USSR and U.K., mm -hmm. Already, U.S. was more powerful than right. those countries, right? Those right. declining states. Currently, let's say U.S. is still more powerful than China, and then China is now rising state. So, mm -hmm. would your theory have different implication or same implication if um, the rising state is still less powerful than the relatively declining? Well, I, 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 so it's, it's a great question, but I actually think the predictions work even better in that situation. Again, it all hinges on the security costs and benefits <laughs> of predation or support, right? So if I'm weaker from a starting point, and then I'm going to be profoundly worried about either getting snookered by a rising state, uh, by a declining state in multipolarity, worrying about being entrapped or ensnared into a conflict I wouldn't want, uh, especially antagonizing a rising state, uh, de a coalition that supports that decline state if I'm not able to counterbalance them using my own resources. And in a bipolar setting, I'd be profoundly worried about, about uh, triggering a conflict or a crisis or a war that I can't possibly win. So these concerns, <laughs> these overall distribution of power calculations that you're flagging are really important, but I think the initial starting point works, reg in works irrespective of what the uh, specific distributive, what, what it specifically looks like. Uh, it just occurred to me that it would be really interesting to uh, identify the capital flows internationally in connection with the emails that, mm -hmm. that say we need to support, you know, Great Britain at all costs. Right, right. If you follow the capital flows, then then you know exactly how that support came through. Well, what's it, so I, I agree with you. It's very interesting, though, if we think about this. The British and the Americans tied their economies together like a way no other states have during the course of World War II. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that despite doing that, despite building the same war economy for all intents and purposes, the British and the, and the Americans, upon the cessation of hostilities, in that cooperation, cut off the British. And I didn't talk about this, but when the British come looking for a loan uh, to keep their economy afloat in 46, 1946, the Americans drive a really hard bargain or somewhat ambivalent about providing that loan. There's a lot of hesitation before doing so. So I think economic flows are really profoundly important, but I don't think they're determined in, in these cases. Well, I'm not talking about just money flows. Yeah. I'm talking about maybe the U.S. subsidized the corn market, mm -hmm. and then we exported five times the amount of corn mm -hmm. to Great Britain mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. we had in the past. Right. That would be a capital sure, flow, absolutely. even though it's not monetary. No, it's a, it, it's a really good point. Uh, I think I need to chew on that a little bit more, but I think the initial instinct would be to be would be to say, if these flows are so intense, and that's what's driving the incentive support, we would not expect to see kind of the waning of American support, of, or at least a moderate, hesitant kind of support upon the cessation of hostilities. So the initial moderate support strategy seems at least a little weird if we think economic flows, even intense ones, drive strategy. But I think it's a really important point. I don't want to understate it. Hey, Jeff Engel. Uh, 
Uh, yes, actually, um, it's a really, really fascinating, a really fascinating topic, and uh, the way that you've got it's just such incredible command of archival resources, as, as you and I have discussed many times. But I have uh, two questions. Yeah. One about each major time. Sure. Uh, the first is, is perhaps a more specific one. The second is, is somewhat more sure. theoretical, though it will not be a theory question. Um, I'm concerned that as you're reading through Hutchings memos, yeah. as you're reading through Blackwell's memos and so on, that there is another element going on in the minds of the people who are actually making the decisions. Because these are only policy advice memos. Mm -hmm. And if, if these policymakers at the NSC are looking at the Soviets in this period of, of massive decline and saying, push, 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 Scowcroft and Bush are simultaneously getting memos saying, don't push too far or else there'll be a coup. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a question of what a strategist might do in an ideal circumstance. Sure. There's also politics sure. at play here. For, uh, just, uh, it, it, are you concerned about this? Because it strikes me no, that, it's, it's that a re the, the yeah. individuals really do matter, and that's going to lead to my second question. Yeah. Uh, so let me answer that one, because this is something I struggle with long and hard, as you could probably imagine, because I'm seeing the same stuff you've been seeing. The way I would put it is this. Uh, the, that concern of don't push too hard, don't push too hard, uh, worry about the personages, worry about the psychology of all this. They're, they're non-variable, right? They've been going on since 88, into, starting in 89. And yet we still see American policy shift in some way. And it's not clear that this is tied to Soviet domestic conditions at this point in time. So what I regard as the shift in American strategy occurs even though we have this background tone of worry about the personality, worry about the personality. And whereas in before in 89, you actually saw this uh, worry of, so of uh, Soviet pushback overlaying the, so the concern about Gorbachev's uh, durability, and therefore Americans were calling for uh, going slow in order to avoid a coup. In 90, we actually see Americans saying a coup might occur, therefore we have to move really fast. And so it's the same basic concern over the person in charge of the USSR, but the logic that results, the nature of American strategy that results changes as well. See, I'm wondering if a solution to this, this point yeah. that you developed for yeah. your, as, as you pursue the book wouldn't be to expand beyond just, I hate to say this, beyond the two-by-two. Two. Yeah. <laughs> but to say, because if, if, if it, the way you're telling the story, yeah. the U.S. goes from supportive to predatory. Mm -hmm. But the way you just described it, what the U.S. is actually doing is going from supportive to a little bit predatory mm -hmm. before it goes to a lot predatory. Yeah. And it strikes me that that's a, a key distinction between the two. So I, I think that's a... I, it's, an, it's, a, it's something I grapple with every day, right? Like, what are my categories? What do I call this stuff? Uh, how do I even discuss these different strategies? Um, I don't really have a good answer. I go back and forth on this matter almost on a daily basis. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, what ha I, I maybe I break with you a little bit because I don't actually see the U.S. being terribly supportive in 89. I see the U.S. being cautiously predatory. And then all of a sudden just expanding that with reckless abandon beginning in February of 90. And you can actually kind of trace uh, beginning in January, late January of 90, the Americans just not giving a flying stuff uh, <laughs> about what the Soviets are going to do in response. And so whereas before the U.S. is very concerned about the Soviet pushback and the, Soviet re re the nature of Soviet concern, somehow this just goes away. And it's not very clear why this is. And so I, I think a lot of it has to do with the American opportuni opportunism that I've kind of laid out here. But uh, I, I take your point very seriously. And I'm not trying to fudge on it. Did you have a follow-up? There was a follow-up about the I, I 46. Did, I'll, I'll ask very briefly because I think sure. it actually relates. And, and that's going back to the earlier period that, um, and Jim alluded to this with his reference to Churchill. Yep. It strikes me that we cannot necessarily paint with the same brush yep. every policymaker throughout the country. Right. I mean, the British assume a completely different policy if yes. you know, Attlee is not the prime minister. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with your characterization of Ernest Devon as being anti-communist. Sure, and, oh, fair but enough. I was being glib on that. that. You know, one, could, one could really peel the onion a little bit further and yep. suggest that the real reason why the Brit Americans are driving such a hard bargain in, in 46 and 47 vis-a-vis -vis the British loan is to ward off congressional concerns. Mm -hmm that the Congress is so fiscally conservative that they need to show that they've got a hard bargain. Mm -hmm. So it's not even that, that Dean Atchison cares to do this, that he feels he has to do this. Right. Right. Um, so the, the, the personality is... Yeah, I, I, I would never disagree with that. Uh, and I definitely need to uh, engage in this a little bit more. And that's not a punt. That's a sincere statement of, you're right, I'm imposing a kind of an overall coding scheme on what are, in fact, very diverse, you know, uh, 
personalities. And what I think is interesting, though, is asking the question, why do some personalities or why do some personal preferences win out over others across time and space? And that's where I think I might be able to offer a little bit of insight. So not, not to skirt your question, but to say, I think uh, some of the dynamics I have laid out kind of encourage poli the senior policymakers to pay attention to certain uh, views over others at different points in time. That's really where I really see my contribution coming from or coming in. Sure, please. Kind of a related uh, yeah, please. question that uh, uh, gets at the, the, the measurement of relative power and yep. decline and, and so on. Can you say a little bit about the role of uh, perceptions as opposed to right. the precision that you're uh, right. imposing here? Because uh, yep. uh, a couple of your examples were actually quite instructive where um, uh, where there was a very clear single event that triggered right. kicked, everyone, kicked everyone in the head. Something that had been missed. Right. Prior to that, right. Why was it so so much of a surprise to the Americans that the British suddenly pulled the plug on their military uh, sure. uh, situation? So, um, uh, can you just say a little bit more about that? Because it would be great if we all had a perfect uh, right. uh, measure of everybody's right. relative position. Well, so I, I think you're raising two different points, and I think both are really important. The first one is to what to what extent do policymakers get the overall assessment right or wrong? Right? And the second question is, what does it take to convince policymakers that something fundamental is occurring? I think on the first point, uh, look, policymakers are paid a lot of money and they have big support staff. They basically get things more or less right. And what would be, what's interesting isn't the question of how close to right do they get it. The question is how far away from the truth do they end up being. <laughs> uh, and I think in general, they get, they get it pretty right. You know, that's the overall story here. It's not like American policymakers are saying, well, the British are the next arrival with the U.S. No, we all kind of know the British are on the wane. The question is how far they are from the tipping point. Why well, is with the Soviets? There's an awareness of Soviet problems. But the question is... Uh, how you know, the question is, how long can the Soviets stay in the game? Which brings me to my second point, which brings me to, to your second question. Um, it's precisely because military policy is a choice, right? You can always choose to invest your marginal dollar or your marginal uh, uh, pound or uh, whatever the Soviets used, uh, iron bars. Um, <laughs> you can always choose to invest the marginal resource into building up a military. Which is why all of a sudden not having the ability to uh, to maintain one's security through military means is so important and kind of codifying and so and showing that something fundamental is going on. Because it's really surprising international politics when states don't have the ability to defend themselves anymore, especially big states. And that's what should really make other states pay attention. It's a way of focusing attention. And that can be both a sincere statement of I'm weak, but it can also be a strategic ploy to get other states to do things for me. Uh, Bob Jordan. This is a similar question, but in, in terms of getting it right, yeah. Uh, looking at the uh, decline of the Soviet Union, yes, and measuring whether it's moderate uh, yep. predation or intense, right? These are pretty much the same people who move from moderate to intense. That's right. Did you get a sense that they had any thought at the end of the day? that they had screwed up the beginning by being moderate hmm. and that they had regrets about that and that's why they moved to the more intense predation. Uh, you know, we, we can look at a lot of yeah. recent history and say, we really screwed that up and therefore we're going to change our conduct. Is there anything that accounts for, for the change in conduct other than the change in conditions? Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to say the, the answer is no, but let me explain. Uh, <clears throat> No, there is no regret over this issue because I actually don't think, and I, and I sincerely mean this, I, I, I don't think there's much to regret in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, in interna you know, international politics is a funny business, and we might look back now and go, you know, Gorbachev, kind of a fuzzy bear, right? He was kind of cuddly. He wasn't going to do much. We all, we all kind of know that now. But if you're sitting in the White House at the time, the question is, how do you know that, right? And more importantly, as Jeff pointed out, there are people around him who are saying, you know, Mr. General Secretary, now's the time we have to move, we have to move, we have to move. <coughs> so it's never quite clear where Soviet red lines are going to be. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's so much regret as a real sense that it just may not be the opportune moment. And if the world is basically good, why risk spoiling it by, you know, okay, we might want to see Eastern Europe liberated, but do we want to risk a war that might destroy Western Europe for the sake of liberating Eastern Europe? So I think there's a real calculation that says this isn't quite worth it at this point in time. And so I don't think it's regret so much as they regard it. They would regard it as strategic. Uh, just to follow on that, yeah. 
is it is it sort of the nature of the beast that when you start seeing a decline, yep. that your predation is always going to be moderate at first and then escalate? Yeah. So it's it, it's a really important question, right? I, I actually. So one thing I haven't spoken about because I'm debating uh, whether to include it in the book itself is what happens in 1991 with the USSR. And this is, I think, a case where predation, so which as we would refer, reverses itself. Uh, in 1991, after Germany is reunified, after Eastern Europe is liberated and the Soviet outer empire is gone, uh, the U.S. is faced with the choice whether to encourage the dissolution of the USSR. And Bush and Scowcroft and Baker and others are very explicit in saying we don't want to see the USSR dead. For, dead. Which, you know, if we think about this, this is weird. We're happy to kill the outer empire, but we want to keep the, so the great power itself kind of on life support. That's, that's a weird behavior. And it actually it turns out, if you, if you, you know, look at the 1991 documents, what we now have of them, it's because American policymakers recognize that the Soviets can't project force outside their borders, but internally they can keep oppressing to their heart's content. And so I don't think it's the case that states always go as, you know, it's monotonically getting weaker. I think this is why I'm saying it's a policy, it's the military stuff is a policy choice. Mm -hmm. And states can recover, states can come back, and the external events can change the incentive structure for different states. And Carissa Clever. Um, so I was wondering if you've thought at all about how the sort of the implications of the theory for regional politics, like mm -hmm. whether, whether sort of regional, uh, at the regional level, countries are pursuing similar strategies uh, with respect to sort of falling regional power yeah. players. Yeah. So it's, it, it, it's important. Uh, have I? Not formally. Uh, not in terms of, you know, cogent things that I would call writing. Uh, what I, maybe things called back of the envelope scribbles to myself to reference at some later date would be a better way of describing it. But I think the point would be, you know, regional politics, politics are a hermetically sealed sphere only so far as, you know, systemically big powers let them be hermetically sealed sphere. So once, once big powers are involved in the region, regional politics take on the characteristics of whatever the international environment look like. But if we think about regional politics just as a cleaved off, you know, sphere of, uh, area, of, area of action, this should be able to explain the behavior of regionally great powers against regionally declining states uh, so long as other big great powers don't get involved, right? That would be the natural experiment, or that would be the ex way to assess this theory. Yeah. And Sandy Fisher. Um, you, your focus has been very strongly on, on military power and security issues, but I'm wondering in the Soviet case if there's another <coughs> kind of predatory behavior yep. on the economic side. And I think of, you know, the when the Soviet Union's economy had really collapsed, that yep. enthusiasts like Jeffrey Green and other neoliberal economists wanted to go in there and recreate the Soviet economy right. in the image of the free market and, and spend a considerable you know, time and effort doing that. And right. then, I guess it kind of fizzled out when they discovered that there was more corruption in the economy. But the whole damn thing was worth it. Yeah. Didn't make it work out so well. But uh, that's a different kind of sure. behavior, and I wonder how it coordinates or doesn't coordinate with the well, it, so I, I, it's an important point, I ha and one I haven't given a lot of thought to because I am not a trained economist and I uh, can barely manage my own bank account, let alone assess international economics. But, the, but my overall flavor of things would be this. Um, I'm focused purely on the strategic sphere for now, right? The military, kind of what we would call geopolitics a long time ago. I think in economic affairs, we can imagine a similar dynamic playing out where it's the Soviet ability to... Uh, provide, put food on the table and all that good stuff that may or may not uh, incentivize varying degrees of predation. But I'm actually not, I don't want to go too far into that one because I just don't understand the terrain enough. Sure in the back. Uh, wasn't there, uh, I have two points. Uh, sure. One Thank is, you. in this period of time, it was a period of great uncertainty. And yes. We didn't know what type of state the new Russia could be. Correct. And there was a lot of debate, as I understand it, within the administration as to how this could transpire. Uh, could it be that they could move toward a type of state that could be integrated into the world, uh, the world order, or would they go off in a different way? Mm -hmm. And the second point is that you always have to look at, will they be rational? You know, uh, what would be the next step if you're up against the wall? Sure. And at some point, you know, why, like we look at the North Korean leader today, we right. don't, know, don't know what this nutcase will do at the, at the next step. Maybe, 
uh, and maybe that was the case with uh, with Russia at right. that time as well. Well, so I, I think there's a re that's a really good insight. Uh, the way I would think about it, the way I think about both those issues, so they kind of come down to how do I deal with uncertainty in international politics, is to ask myself the question, uh, not really how rational do these leaders have to be or how confident in state type do I have to be, but how bad do things become if I get it wrong and how bad could things be for those other states if they get it wrong. And so in that regard, I actually think... Uh, I, I think, number one, a lot of American strategy was predicated on the, on the problem, as Jeff raised a minute ago, that we don't know how Russia is going to shake out, how the USSR is going to shake out. And as a result, a certain, when you, when you, that, that generates a logic of get while the getting is good, uh, if you think you can get away with it, kind of scot-free. So that's point number one. And point number two, when it comes to keeping other states in check, part of American logic, part of the get while the getting is good phenomenon, was to be able to say to the Russians going forward, or say the Soviets going forward, look, if you want access to this world, or you don't want to be uh, a big, a big version of North Korea, play our game. Right? You're creating long-term incentives for those states to cooperate and do things that you, you, the United States, find attractive. So I think that's a big part of the logic here. You've been analyzing Russia. Great Britain and the U.S. Yes. With this framework that you're posing on, sort of post-war history up until 1991, can you just take that framework and try to move it to the U.S. and China from 20 years ago till today? Mm -hmm. Kind of riff on that for a while. Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll give you the quick and dirty version. Um, if we think about China in the 1990s, right, and we measure various indices of power in East Asia in the 1990s, it's basically a multipolar world, right? China's roughly on par with Japan, it's roughly on par with what's left of Russia, India's in there somewhere, the U.S. is certainly involved. If we think about what China feared first and foremost in the 1990s, it was a U.S. pull-up from East Asia. Every time the U.S. hinted that it was maybe going to change the, uh, the U.S.-Japanese alliance, every time it indicated it may not be paying enough attention to East Asia, the Chinese were amongst the first to say, please stay involved in the United States. And I think that behavior has more or less continued through today, although as China has grown, and it maybe would be called a great power plus today, right, stronger than Japan, not nearly a pure competitor to the U.S., that incentive structure is still there, but it's kind of framed. And so I think a lot's going to depend, at least going forward, uh, whether this desire to keep the U.S. involved or get the U.S. out, it's going to depend on whether China really thinks it's going to be the next hegemon, either in East Asia or globally. And, or, and built into that is the question of, is China going to stagnate and face all sorts of internal repercussions from its kind of uneven economic development? And if the answer is yes, it's going to pay lots of costs, then East Asia is going to be more or less multipolar, which should generate a logic that says keep the U.S. involved. And if China overcomes these problems and continues growing and eventually emerges as something that looks like a pure competitor, I would expect that China to try to push the U.S. out. And so that's how I would riff on it. So I have one more sort of current events question. Yeah. Um, the historical overview is fabulous. And, but specifically with the Soviet case, yeah. it got me to thinking of the current yeah. issues in Eastern Europe. And I've got Ukraine on the brain, so I've got to ask you about You wrote this great foreign affairs article about Ukraine a little while ago, and the, ex the American experience yeah. in, in the early and mid-1990s. And as I understood your argument then, yeah. um, the United States made tacit promises not to push NATO beyond Germany. Correct. Nothing in writing, but made important tacit word-of-mouth commitments Correct. not to do that. As a way of, of, this is not financial compensation, but this is a kind of compensation. Yeah. Greasing the skids. A, a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a yeah. little bit of a, a sweetener at the end of the... Yeah. Cold War, but the, the question I have is if, if if you're right that 1990 was a period of predation, right? Where where George H. W. Bush took the gloves off and right. said, "Well, we're not we don't care about you anymore, so we're gonna right. we're gonna take what, what, we what would want explain here. that?" Uh, well, no, no. My, my question is, why would the Soviets believe our tacit promises? Yeah, right? they're, they're, the view from Moscow is the U.S. finally sees how weak we really are, right. and they're taking the crown jewel of our of our empire right. away from us. But they're making these these backroom promises that they won't actually put on right. paper. Why should we believe the backroom promises? Right. So the, the quick and dirty answer is the Soviets had no choice, uh, and I don't mean that in a glib way. Here, here's what I'm trying to communicate with that. 
if you're a declining if you're a declining grid power in a bipolar system, right? The only way you're going to have a good outcome for yourself is if the rising state set, signs off on it. And if that's the case, then the Soviets have no choice but to try to lock the U.S. into whatever deals the U.S. is willing to offer. And if the U.S. chooses to, you know, change the deal, the Soviets just you know, grin and bear it and try to tra trade on uh, the future goodwill of the United States in that regard because they have no other <coughs> options to arrest American predation until the United States reaches the Soviet border. And if you want to overlay that, a little bit of uncertainty, and this goes back to Jeff's point, if we think the Soviets might be coming back in the long term or that Gorbachev could be evicted, maybe the last thing you want to do if you're, if you're sitting in uh, the United States is to, point, is to, you know, to jump and yell and smile as you're, as you're stabbing the Soviets in the stomach because that might be a situation where you encourage the Soviets to work extra special hard. And so I think that this kind of bipolar dynamic encourages false reassurance by the U.S., but also kind of a grin and bear it situation so just by the to, Soviets. Uh, based on that logic, yeah. do, do you think that it would have been better if the first Bush administration had put in writing NATO stops at Germany rather than just stop with these sort of backroom right. promises? Would that have Be better for aid? better for whom? Because I because I I, I, I number, no, no, I, I, and, no so so the, the reason I say that right because I could imagine a story uh, that says look the U S was going to want to own Europe no matter what right and maybe it's better to put it in writing and get the Soviets to give the Soviets some reassurances maybe that way the Russians and the Germans and the French can f wave a piece of paper in the U.S. face and go ha ha you promised us you can't do it but at the same time if the U.S. really does want to you know, uh, if, if power abhors a vacuum and post -Cold, and post Cold War Europe is Eastern Europe is basically a vacuum then the U.S. may have wanted to move in irrespective and in that case not putting it in writing avoids a crisis of confidence a clash well like you've got three choices right, right. Uh, not promise anything, right. which is probably the most honest thing you can do. Right. You don't know what you're going to want later. Right. Uh, make verbal promises or make written promises. Right. And, and it strikes me that not promising anything or making written promises probably make the most sense. I agree. I would agree with you. But so, so <clears throat> is again, if it's yeah, yeah, yeah. 1990 all over again, would you have done it differently? I probably would have said nothing. And I think that's what the Bush administration belatedly came to recognize. Mm. Uh, in fact, after... I mean, this is this is something of a long, boring story. But after the initial American offer of we will not expand NATO eastward, uh, two weeks later, Baker, James, James Baker, in discussions with the Germans, actually says, "Oh, I misspoke. Uh, I shouldn't have promised that. I just meant to say we won't put NATO military forces immediately into eastern Germany." So there's a kind of American belated recognition of probably shouldn't have said that. Probably should have done the same nothing strategy. Uh, so I think there is an effort to walk it back that goes into this whole notion of get all the gettings good and don't say anything that might tie your hands going forward. Great. Well, with that, uh, please join me in thanking well, Professor Thank you, Schultz. guys.